Vampire Hunter D, Volume 4, Tale of the Dead Town, written by Hideyuki Kikuchi, illustrations by Yoshitaka Amano. Vampire Hunter D, Journey by Night, Chapter 1, First Part. On the Frontier Nothing was considered more dangerous than a journey by night. Claiming the night was their world, the nobility had once littered the globe with monsters and creatures of legend, as if to adorn the pitch black with a touch of deadly beauty. Those same repugnant creatures ran rampant in the land of darkness to this very day. And that was how the vampires bared their fangs at the human idea that held the light of day as the time for action, and the dark of night for rest. The darkness of night was the greatest of truths, the vampires claimed, and the ruler of the world. Farewell, white light of summer. That was why the night was filled with menace. The moans of dream demons lingered in the wind, and the darkness whispered the threats of dimension-ripping beasts. Just beyond the edge of the woods glowed eyes the color of jasper. So many eyes. Even well-armed troops sent into devastated sections of the capital felt so relieved after they'd slipped through the blocks of dilapidated apartment complexes that they'd flopped down right there on the road. Out on the frontier, it was even worse. On the main roads... Crude way stations had been built at intervals between one lodging place and the next. But, when the sun went down on one of the support roads linking the goodness-forsaken villages, travelers were forced to defend themselves with nothing more than their own two hands and whatever weapons they could carry. There were only two beings that chose to travel by night the nobility, and Dampiers. Particularly if the Dampier was a vampire hunter. Scattering a shower of moonlight far and wide, the shadowy form of a horse and rider climbed a desolate hill. The mount was just an average cyborg horse, but the features of the rider were as clean and clear as a jewel like the strange beauty of the darkness, and the moon crystallized. Every time the all-too-insistent wind touched him, it trembled with uncertainty, whirled, and headed off bearing a whole new air, carrying a disquieting aura, his wide-brimmed traveler's hat, the ink-black cape and scarf darker than darkness, and the scabbard of the elegant longsword that adorned his back were all faded and worn enough to stir imaginings of the arduous times this traveler had seen. The young traveler had his eyes closed, perhaps to avoid the wind-borne dust. His profile was so graceful, it seemed the master craftsman in heaven and above had made it his most exquisite work. The rider appeared to be thoroughly exhausted and immersed in a lonely sleep. Sleep. For him it was a mere break in the battle, but a far cry from peace of mind. Something else mixed with the groaning of the wind. And the traveler's eyes opened. A lurid light coursed into them, and then quickly faded. His horse never broke its pace. But a little over ten seconds was all they needed to reach the summit of the hill. Now the other sounds were clear. The crack of a gun and howls of wild beasts. The traveler looked down at the plain below, spying a mid-sized motorhome that was under attack. Several lesser dragons were prowling around it. 
more children of the night sown by the nobility. Ordinarily, their kind dwelt in swamplands farther to the south, but occasionally problems with the weather controllers would send packs of dragons north. The migration of dangerous species was a serious problem on the frontier. The motorhome was already half-wrecked. Holes had been ripped in the roofs of both the cab and the living quarters, and the lesser dragons kept sticking their heads in. The situation was clear just from the smoking scraps of wood, the sleeping bags, and a pair of partially eaten and barely recognizable human bodies lying in front of the motorhome. Due to circumstances beyond their control, most likely something to do with the propulsion system, the family had been forced to camp out instead of sleeping in their vehicle like they should. But words couldn't begin to describe how foolhardy they'd been to expect one little campfire to keep the creatures that prowled the night at bay. There were three sleeping bags. But there weren't enough corpses to account for everyone. Once again, a gunshot rang out. A streak of orange from a window in the living quarter split the darkness and one of the dragons reeled back as the spot between its eyes exploded. For someone foolish enough to camp out at night, the shooter seemed well informed and incredibly skilled with a gun. People who lived up north had usually never heard where to aim a kill shot on southern creatures like these lesser dragons. But a solution to that puzzle soon presented itself. There was a large magneto bike parked beside the vehicle. Someone was pitching in to rescue them. The rider tugged on the reins of his cyborg horse, shaking off the moonlight that encrusted its body like so much dust. And the horse suddenly began its descent. Galloping down the steep slope with the sort of speed normally reserved for level ground, the mound left a gale in its wake as it closed on the lesser dragons. Noticing the headlong charge by this new foe, a dragon to the rear of the pack turned, and the horse and rider slipped by its side like a black wind. Bright blood didn't spurt from between the creature's eyes until the horse had come to a sudden halt, and the traveler had dismounted with a flourish of his cape. The way he walked toward the creatures, with their colossal maws gaping and rows of bloody teeth bared, seemed leisurely at first glance, but in due time showed the swiftness of a swallow in flight. All around the young man in black there was a sound of steel meeting steel time and again. Unable to pull apart the jagged teeth they had just brought together, each and every one of the lesser dragons around him collapsed in a bloody spray as gashes opened between their eyes. And the dragon leaping at him from the motorhome's roof was no exception. The young man's gorgeous countenance seemed wary of the cries of the dying creatures, but his expression didn't change in the slightest, and, without even glancing at the two mangled bodies, he returned his long sword to its sheath and headed back to his cyborg horse. As if to say he'd just done this on a lark, as if to suggest he didn't give a thought to the well-being of any survivors, he turned his back on this death-shrouded world and tightened his grip on the reins. Hey! Wait a minute! A masculine voice called it in a somewhat agitated manner. The young man stopped and turned around. The vehicle's door opened and a bearded man in a leather vest appeared. 
In his right hand, he held a single-shot armor-piercing rifle. A machete was tucked through his belt. With the grim countenance he sported, he'd have looked more natural holding the latter instead of a gun. Not that I don't appreciate your help, bucko, but there's no account for you just turning and making tracks like that now. Come here for a minute. There's only one survivor, the young man said. And it's a child. So you should be able to handle it alone. A tinge of surprise flooded the other man's hirsute face. How did you... Oh, you saw the sleeping bags. Now wait just a minute, bucko. The atomic reactor is a cracked heat exchanger. And the whole motorhome's lousy with radiation now. That's why the family went outside in the first place. The kid got a pretty good dose. Hurry up and take care of it then. The supplies I'm packing won't cut it. The town doctor's got a seat of this. Where are you headed, buddy? The Zemeckis rendezvous point? That's right. The young man in black replied. Hold on. Just hold everything. I know the roads around here like the back of my hand. So do I. The young man turned away from the biker once again. Then he stopped. As he turned back, his eyes were eternally cold and dark. And the child was standing behind the biker. Her black hair would have hung past her waist if it hadn't been tied back by a rainbow-hued ribbon. The rough cotton shirt and long skirt did little to hide her age or the swell of her full bosom. The girl was a beauty, around 17 or 18 years old. As she gazed at the young man, a curious hue of emotion filled her eyes. There was something in the gorgeous features of the youth that could make her forget the heart-rending loss of her family, as well as the very real danger of losing her own life. Extending her hand, she was just about to say something when she crumpled to the ground face down. What did I tell you? She's hurt bad. She's not going to last till dawn. That's why I need your help. The youth wheeled his horse around without a word. Which one of us will carry her? He asked. Yours truly, of course. Getting you help so far has been like pulling teeth, so I'll be damned if I'm going to let you do the fun part. The man got a leather belt off his bike and came back, then put the young woman on his back and cleverly secured her to himself. Hands off! The man said, glaring at the youth in black as he straddled his magneto bag. The girl fit perfectly into the seat behind him. It looked like quite a cozy arrangement. Okay, here I go. Follow me. The man grabbed the handlebars, but before twisting the grip starter, he turned and said, That's right. I didn't introduce myself, did I? I'm John M. Brassily, Pluto the Eighth. D. That's a good name you got there. Just don't go looking to shorten mine for something a little easier to say. When you call me, I'll thank you kindly to do it by my full name. John M. Brassily, Pluto the Eighth. Okay? But, while the man was driving his point home, Dee was looking to the skies. What is it? The biker asked. Things out there have caught the scent of blood, and are on their way. The black creatures framed against the moon were growing closer. A flock of avian predators. And lupine howls could be heard in the wind. 
Page break indicated by a small cross. Expectations to the contrary. No threat materialized to hamper the party's progress. They rode for about three hours. When the hazy mountains far across the plain began to fill their field of view and take on a touch of reality, John M. Braselli, Pluto VIII, turned his sharp gaze to Dee, who rode alongside him. If we go to the foot of that there mountain, the town should be by. What business you got with them anyway, bucko? He asked. When Dee made no answer, he added, Damn, but the tough guy again, I see. I bet you used to just standing there doing a strong, silent type routine and getting all the ladies chum. You're good at what you do, I'll give you that. Just don't count on that always doing the trick for you. Sooner or later, it's always some straight shooter like me that ends up the center of attention. D looked ahead without saying a word. Bah, you're no fun, the biker said. I'm gonna go on it the rest of the way. Hold it. Pluto VIII went pale for a minute at the sharp command, but, in what was probably a false show of courage, he gave the grip stutter a good twist. Uranium fuel sent pale flames spouting from the boosters, and the bike shot off in a cloud of dust. It stopped almost as quickly. The engine was still shuddering away, but the wheels were just kicking up sand. In the dazzling moonlight, his atomic-powered bike was not only refusing to budge an inch despite its 5,000 horsepower output, it was actually sinking into the ground. Damn it all, he hissed. A sand viper. And the creature in question was a colossal serpent that lived deep in the earth, and, although no one had ever seen the entire body of one, they were said to grow upwards of twenty miles long. Frighteningly enough, though the creatures were said to live their entire lives without ever moving a fraction of an inch, some believe they used high-frequency vibrations to create fragile layers of earth and sand in thousands of places on the surface so they might feed on those unfortunate enough to stumble into one of their traps. These layers moved relentlessly downward, becoming a kind of quicksand. Due to the startling motion the sands displayed, those who set foot into them would never make it out again. To get some idea of how tenacious the jaws of this dirt and sand trap were, one had only to watch how the 5,000 horses in that atomic engine strained themselves to no avail. For all the bike struggling, its wheels had already sunk halfway into the sand. Hey, don't just stand there watching, stone face. If you've got a drop of human blood in your veins, I'll be out here. Pluto the Eighth shouted fervently. His words must have done the trick because Dee grabbed a thin coil of rope off the back of his saddle and dismounted. If you screw this up, the rope will get pulled down too. So make your throat count, the man squawked, and then his eyes went wide. The gorgeous young man didn't throw him the rope. Keeping it in hand, he started to calmly walk into the quicksand. Pluto the Eighth opened his mouth to howl some new curse at the youth, but it just hung open, and for good reason. The young man in black had started to stride elegantly over deadly jaws that would wolf down any creature they could find. His black raiment danced in the wind, and the moonlight ricocheting off it as flecks of silver. He almost looked like the Grim Reaper, coming in the guise of aid, but ready to wrap a black cord around the neck of those reaching out to him for succor. The rope flew through the air, excitingly grabbing hold of the end of it, 
Pluto the Ape tied it around his butt's handlebars. The rest of the coiled rope still in hand. D went back to solid ground. He climbed onto his cyborg horse without saying a word. All right, now, on the count of... Pluto never got to finish what he was saying as his bike was tugged forward. Hey! Give me a second. Let me give it some gas, too. He started to say, but he only had a moment to tighten his grip on the throttle before the bike and its two riders were free of the living sands and its tires were resting once more on solid ground. Bucko! What the hell are you, anyway? Pluto the Eighth asked the mounted youth, with a shocked look on his face. We'd be lucky to get away from a sand viper with a tractor pulling us. Never mind a cyborg horse. And here you go, and you hang us out without even working up a sweat. I thought you were a mite too good looking. But you're not human after all, are you? Smacking his hands together. He exclaimed, I've got it. You're a dampier. D didn't move. His eternally cold gaze was fixed on the moonlit reaches of the darkness, as if seeking a safe path. Well, you don't have anything to worry about, the biker added. My motto is, keep an open mind. It don't matter if the folks around me have red skin or green. I don't discriminate. So long as they don't do wrong by yours truly, that is. Naturally, that includes damp ears, too. Pluto the Eighth's voice had the ring of unquestionable sincerity to it. Suddenly, without glancing at the biker who seemed ready to burst with the milk of human kindness, D asked in a low voice, Are you ready? For what? Pluto the Eighth must have caught something in the hunter's disinterested tone because his eyes went to D, and then instantly swept around to the left and right, to the fore and rear. Aside from the piece of land the three of them were on, little black holes were forming all over the place. As sand coursed down into them the way it does into an antlion pit, the funnel-shaped holes quickly grew larger until one touched another, encircling the trio like the footprints of some unseen giant. First part, end.